Murder is hard work, especially if people fight back. Then there's the really big obstacle. You want to get away with it. You're determined to stab four people living in a single home in the still of the night and then disappear without leaving a clue to your identity. Brian Koberger, a 28-year-old doctoral candidate in the Criminal Justice and Criminology Department at Washington State University, was pulled from his parents' home in the rural Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania and charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony burglary. Mortensen would reveal more about what happened that night. She told the authorities she had heard crying, opened her bedroom door, and saw a man in black clothes and a mask walking past her. Frozen and in shock, she stood immobile. As There's only so much that can be authoritatively reported. Gunderson quickly called his boss, Captain Roger Lanier, the head of the 24 officer operations division. He found him not unexpectedly for a Sunday, sitting down to lunch with his family. Lanier was a veteran cop. He had spent more than 20 years in the force in nearby Lewiston before, before having been lured six years earlier to Moscow with a captain's rank. The University Office of Public Safety and Security sent a vandal alert email to the students and faculty. Moscow PD investigating a homicide on King Road near campus. Suspect is not known at this time. Stay away from the area and shelter in place. The chief had been getting death threats. He'd counted six. A virulent collection of unsigned letters and barking phone messages emphatically promising he'd be killed. And those missives were in addition to the tall pile of rude and scatological, although less murderous, emails and notes he'd received. The ostensible reason for these threats? He had ordered his officers to enforce the mayor's and the city council's coronavirus restrictions. People had received summonses for not wearing masks in public. And at a defiantly maskless prayer vigil in the city hall parking lot, several of the more reverent in the open-air assembly had been cuffed and hauled off on prize orders. His no-nonsense policing had made the chief a lot of enemies. The municipal restrictions ran counter to the deep-seated, self-reliant pioneer spirit of many Idahoans, And no less a force of enmity in the town. There was a very active and rapidly growing archly fundamentalist congregation at Pastor Doug Wilson's Christ Church, which not only saw masks and vaccinations as counter to God's teachings, but also held that our local city government, law enforcement included, is a nest of incompetence and corruption. But by the fateful November weekend when the murders occurred, Chief Fry had hoped that all the bad feelings that had been simmering in the town over the past two years had, with the end of the coronavirus restrictions, also largely slipped away. The previous spring, he had missed a chance to go on a prolonged elk hunt. He hadn't felt right about leaving Moscow for too long, but he no longer had such qualms. On November 12th, Brian and his wife Julie had taken a visit to a friend nearly three hours away. By the time Lanier had finally reached him, it was hours after the discovery of the bodies. And by the time Fry finally entered the home on King Road, it was dark outside, according to several accounts. Close to 6 p.m. For some obtruse reason, he thought it was important to go home first and change into his chief's uniform. 
Perhaps he hadn't fully grasped the magnitude of the disaster. Or maybe, after 28 years as a Moscow cop, he had felt the imprimatur of his uniform was integral to his ability to command. But what he saw that evening left him, he would confide to a friend, physically and emotionally drained. He was the father of two daughters who had attended UI, and he also graduated from the university nearly three decades earlier. It was impossible, he said, not to feel a visceral tie to the victims and their parents. The cruelty of the crime was deep and affecting, and yet he knew there was police work to be done. His mind was racing, but quixotically, perhaps, within moments, a buried memory pushed itself forward. Three years earlier, Fry had been chosen to attend the 10-week course at the FBI's National Training Academy in Quantico, Virginia. He was on the cusp of turning 50, and the impending milestone he'd confided to a close friend had triggered a soul-searching. He'd wanted to prove that even as he was acknowledging the inevitability of his soon becoming a senior citizen, he was still the sort of cop who could break up a bar fight or strap on SWAT gear when some local went berserk and started shooting up the courthouse. A chief goes to lunches at the Chamber of Commerce and plays golf with the mayor. Fry wanted to show he still could be more. His friends called him old school, and it was an appraisal that had always sat well with him. So it had been important, so it had been very important to Fry to complete the 6.1 mile obstacle course at Quantico called the Yellow Brick Road. The signs nailed to the tree at the starting line read hurt, agony, and pain. There was climbing over walls, crawling under barbed wire, slashing through streams, hauling up steep cliffs, and running full speed through rocky winding trails. And Fry did it. The certificate he received in recognition of this accomplishment is displayed with pride across, across from his desk and headquarters. It was what he first talked about when he talked about his time with the FBI. But on this unsettling evening, another memory reached out to him. A day or so before he'd taken the yellow brick road, he had been led to a class by a member of the FBI Behavioral Science Unit. The lecturer had explained how the Bureau had been able to get into the heads of killers. They studied what made them kill and how to catch them before they'd kill again. What if Bry asked himself with sudden alarm. A serial killer had attacked the four students. Bry called the Bureau and asked for assistance. It was quickly arranged. A team of agents, eventually about 40 in total, would be dispatched to Moscow. A smaller group, flying in from the Salt Lake City office, would be arriving as soon as tomorrow. And, as he'd specifically requested, three members of the Behavioral Analysis Unit, two men and a woman, were also dispatched. Fry, however, wasn't done yet. He had been working restlessly through the night, but with the dawn of a new day, he realized there was something he'd forgotten. When Rand Walker got the call, he was in his GMC pickup, heading down the twisting 700-foot driveway that led from his house to the main road in town. He looked at the caller ID and figured he knew why the chief was calling first thing in the morning. His friend wanted to apologize. A week or so earlier, Walker, along with his band, had been playing at Bucer's Coffee House and Pub downtown. They performed 70s cover songs. A lot of Eagles, a lot of Van Morrison, and their version of Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline was a get-out-of-your-seat favorite. They had quite a following in northern Idaho, and the chief had promised he'd be there, only he'd never showed. No problem, Chief, Walker began breezily. I know you got plenty to do. You'll catch us next time. It's something else, Fry said curtly. I need you to stand by. Immediately, Walker knew something awful had happened. A PhD with a private practice in Moscow. He also served as the department's psychologist. Some of my young officers are going to need your help, Fry continued. 
Then he corrected himself. Actually, it's not just the young ones. A different sort of predator. The wolf had gotten away. It was spring break 2010. And Brett Payne, a 20-year-old University of Idaho student, had been determined to bag the big gray wolf that had been seen roaming up on Lindstrom Peak, deep in the high timber of northern Idaho's St. Joe National Forest. Only after four days, Payne hadn't even found a single paw print. When Payne broke camp that morning, he considered giving up, but in the end, it just didn't feel right, so he kept at it. And at about 4 p.m., the sun still high in the sky, he spotted tracks. He followed them for the next two hours. And there it was. A big male wolf laying across a draw in the middle of the road, about 300 yards in the distance. Payne quietly fell to the forest floor. He could see the animal clearly through his rifle scope. If the wolf caught a human scent, he'd bolt. But the wind was in Payne's favor. He put his finger on the rifle's trigger, started to apply pressure, yet still hesitated. It was intense, he later explained. He needed to calm down. But suddenly the wolf raised his head, so Payne shot. The bullet went through the wolf's chest, dropping it at once. Payne had bagged his wolf. It was now 12 years later, and Payne was once again the relentless hunter. Only now he was on the trail of a different sort of predator. He was the lead police investigator in the four King Road homicides. Payne had come to the Moscow PD just two years earlier. After serving in the 82nd Airborne Division in Afghanistan and a stint stateside in the MPs. Chief Fry had taken an instant liking to his squared away military demeanor and promoted him quickly to corporal over other more experienced officers. When the state police had asked who'd be leading the morning briefings, Fry, without thinking too much about it, chose Payne. For one thing, the chief knew that the young corporal had been involved in several complex forensic investigations with the MPs. That sort of technical expertise, the chief suspected, could come in handy. And for another, Fry had heard the story about the wolf. The chief, an old elk hunter, had come to appreciate the tenacity. It was half the battle in any hunt, maybe more. And so nearly every morning, at 7 a.m. in the weeks following the murders, Payne would be up at the front of the conference room in police headquarters, leading the case briefings. The room was big, filled with rows of polished blonde wood tables, sitting on a gray pattern carpet. Ceiling lights kept things very bright, and there was a band of small rectangular windows running in a row near the top of a side wall that let light in too. Everything looked brand new and very corporate, as if a mid-level insurance company had just moved in. But there was a murder board up, rows of gory homicide photos and everyone in the room had a gun. Conferences would begin with a recitation of what the investigators knew. It was not a long list. Consider. Fact. The four students were killed in their sleep sometime between 3 and 5 a.m. In the weeks ahead, they'd develop a more precise timeline. The murders the authorities deduced occurred between 4 and 4.25 a.m. Fact, there was no sign of forced entry or robbery. Fact, a single weapon had been used, a long-bladed knife, and a tan leather knife sheath stamped with the U.S. Marine Corps insignia was found laying next to Mogan's bed. Fact, there was no trail of blood outside the house. Fact, the house was a repository a large collection of forensic evidence blood, saliva hair, prints DNA but whether any of these belonged to the killer after the autopsies the general consensus held that it was a single assailant still was undetermined these were all the investigators agreed important pieces in the puzzle 
yet they were not enough. For more than three weeks, the early morning conferences ended in a grim litany of what remained unknown. They couldn't figure out how the killer had gotten away seemingly without leaving a clue. And they had no idea why he had chosen these victims. A weird feeling. It was Arthur Conan Doyle back in 1887 who first introduced the role of a consulting detective. Doyle's ingenuous hero, Sherlock Holmes, boasted, We have lots of government detectives and lots of private ones. When these fellows are at fault, they come to me, and I manage to put them on the right scent. And now, as the investigation in Moscow plotted on and frustratingly on, an exasperated Chief Fry appealed to locals to become, in effect, consulting detectives. He wanted help to put his men on the right scent. Detectives are looking for context to the events and people involved in these murders, a Moscow PD press release announced. To assist with the ongoing investigation, any odd or out of the ordinary events that took place should be reported. And nearly begging, the release urged, your information, whether you believe it is significant or not, might be the piece of the puzzle that helps investigators solve these murders. The tips poured in. A new generation of consulting detectives armed with cell phones and laptops with access to a vast repository of information from selfies to Facebook pages and further stoked by the barrage of the raw theories and hearsay disseminated on Reddit and 4chan. Embrace the opportunity. It was a real-life mystery that had the compelling allure of a particularly thorny CSI episode. And, not least, the police were pleading for help. By a recent count, more than 9,025 email tips were received, in addition to the 4,575 phone calls and 6,050 digital media submissions. An army of law enforcement analysts were assigned to the long, daunting task to see if in all the oysters there was a single pearl. It was the back bearing of all time. Much of it led down rabbit holes of fatuous speculation. Some was not just wrong-headed, but cruel. Innocent ex-boyfriends a hoodie-wearing bystander lurking at a food truck where Maddie and Kaylee had ordered early morning bowls of carbonara, soak up the alcohol ingested during the last carefree pub crawl of their lives. A bro neighbor who insisted on sharing rambling anecdotes with every reporter who knocked on his door. And frat brothers who were rumored to be stoked up on steroids and driven by long, gestating grievances. All were callously and persistently slandered with a malicious authority. It got so madcap that a history professor at the university decided she had to sue to put an end to one internet sleuth's bizarre speculation that a failed romance with one of the women had driven the teacher to kill. And then the analyst hit a gold seam. The overnight assistant manager, her name at her request remained secret, for a gas station on Troy Road, not far from the house on King Road, had decided she might as well see what she could do. She had not been working the night of the murders, but nevertheless, she spent the downtime on her graveyard shift, reviewing the videos recorded by the station's surveillance cameras on November 13th. I had a weird feeling, she later said. For two nights, she intermittently kept at it, but found nothing. And on the third night, she spotted a white car speeding down Highway 8 before turning pell-mell down a side street. She took a screenshot of the car and emailed it to the tip line address. Two days later, Moscow police arrived at the gas station to confiscate hours of surveillance footage. And after just a quick view, they began to feel the hunt was at last on. Encouraged, they reached out on a hunch to Kane Francitic. Francitic 
recently retired and now investing in real estate, was a freewheeling guy who shares on his website that he listens to classical vinyl while drinking single malt scotch. He also owned a six-unit rental complex on Linda Lane, about three-tenths of a mile from where the bodies had been found, with a surveillance camera fixed to the roof. I downloaded it and gave them access to everything from 2 a.m. through noon on that Sunday the 13th, he said. Once those tapes were reviewed, the same telltale white car was spotted. And again, it appeared to be making a breakneck getaway through the dark 3 a.m. streets. With this confirmed sighting, a different pace, a different mood took over the investigation. The team felt they could now march forward with a purpose. The FBI laboratory enhancement had succeeded in deciphering the blurred image of the car. It was a white 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra. There were 22,000 Hondas in the region that matched the search criteria. And one of them, the police starting to suspect, had been driven by a killer. Only finding the one Elantra would lead to an arrest as a needle in a haystack sort of challenge. The search, even with a small army of burrowers, was a nearly impossible task. Then, as the holiday season approached, there was sort of a hint of a Christmas miracle. Chief Fry, for once upbeat, met late in the morning of December 20th with Rand Walker, the department psychologist, and Rod Olps, one of the police chaplains, in the courthouse law library. It was one of the few places they could huddle where the chief felt no one would be listening. I'm going to need you two to get ready, he said with deliberate coyness. I'm going to need you before too long. The two men eagerly asked whether there was a break in the case. Fry did his best to rein in a pregnant smile. All I'm saying, he reiterated, is I need you both to stand by. I might be calling you very soon. But at 4.30 that afternoon, the Moscow Police Public Communications Team issued a flash update. Investigators are aware of a Hyundai Elantra located in Eugene, Oregon, and have spoken with the owner. The vehicle is not believed to have any relation to the property in Moscow, Idaho, or the ongoing murder investigations. And just like that, the psychologist and the chaplain knew that the chief, despite the hopeful conversation earlier that day, would not be calling them anytime soon. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content. And if that's not enough, you can join our Patreon. Don't have a tinfoil hat? It's okay. We'll make you one. It's that easy. See you guys in the next video. See you later. Bye.